greetings, happy holidays. Uh, I just wanted to mention that when we select the topic of conversation, oftentimes it's by suggestion from you guys, um, but most of the time it's because of the choices that we have to show. And so I don't want you to think that we're not listening to you, it's just that my collection only has, you know, certain pieces. But that being said, I am surrounded by an embarrassment of riches here. Uh, this week's topic is Vivian Westwood. And because she's been around for almost 50 years designing, which is mind-boggling, her relevance continues. And uh, prior to doing any episode, we rally around the computer and do research that way. But you can see we also have um, an incredible amount of books. This is not all of them. We have over a dozen books that we used to come up with the information that we'll be sharing with you. So uh, know that a lot of this information is available online. So if you get inspired, which is my hope why we're doing this, you will run to the computer and dig a little deeper. So that being said, um, I want to say that uh, I guess it was in 2007, I had the great fortune of going up to San Francisco specifically to see an exhibition on Web Westwood that had also been at the Victorian and Albert Museum in 2003. There is a book that accompanied the v &A exhibit. I highly recommend getting that because it covers a very wide uh, range of her design career. Um, that going up to that exhibit literally blew my mind because I could not believe the breadth of her work and the transitions that she's gone through from the very beginning to what she's doing now, which is so technical. Uh, we have actually a really nice representation of her body of work from the late 70s through the 90s. And we actually also have a few examples of her accessories too. Her relationship with Malcolm McLaren started in 1965 and it predates her being a designer. Her, their interests in general were fashion, music, and graphic design. And you can see how a lot of that was infused in her, her designs. One of my favorite quotes that I got from my research was, be reasonable and demand the impossible. I really love that. So, as she progressed in her relationship with Malcolm McLaren um, and the music part of their relationship, she became familiar with um, musical groups and uh, entertainers like Adam Ant, Bow Wow Wow, and of course, the Sex Pistols. There's a whole chapter on that, right? Um, Westwood was very drawn to rebellion even in her youth, and that's something that continues to this day. She uses her fashion as a way to communicate her protests. If you see how simple her clothing was, because she repurposed a lot of things early on, but as she progressed, I believe it was in the mid-80s, um, she got into uh, researching. She's a very heady person. She's an intellectual and she was stimulated by the construction of clothing and so she did a lot of research and you'll see in the 80s how her clothing began to shift into a more design oriented uh, a lot of it is really difficult drafting and so kudos to her for figuring that one out in the early 2000s I was in Paris at the time that Christie's had an auction that was called um, Hip Hop, I believe, the collection of Jean-Charles de Castelbajac, otherwise known as JCDC. And I couldn't, I, I had to go and uh, preview it. Well, as a result, I ended up buying many pieces, several for uh, Golly Esther down the street, because she collects things that have um, Americana or advertising on it. And the word got out that I was one of the, I guess, bigger buyers of the clothing. There was artwork in there as well. And as a result, um, Castelbajac approached me here when he was in the States. And from that, I actually met his ex-wife, Catherine, 
otherwise known as Kate. And um, from that connection, I ended up buying a large collection of uh, JCDC, but also, interestingly enough, Westwood. Because in 1972, the story that Jean Charles told me was that he happened across a woman who was sewing chicken bones onto t shirts. And through conversation, they ended up becoming roommates. They, they invited McLaren and Westwood to come and live with them. And they forged a friendship, and um, Kate ended up getting a lot of really fantastic Westwood pieces. So a few of these pieces in the collection are from Kate. So now on to the clothes. I think we should start chronologically. And there are a few pieces that we did not date because it takes a long time to figure it out. But really the most famous, I think, piece is uh, the seditionary pants. They were done in the late 1970s. And there is a piece missing. The strap uh, is missing from this. But these pieces are really rare. And the label actually says Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood Seditionaries Personal Collection. So um, the construction on this, she's, she repeats this uh, um, seditionary style pant in another piece that I have, which is much later. But you can see that she does the seditionary style in the pants, but she does her love of historic British uh, tailoring in the jacket. And this is Vivian Westwood gold label, which is their top of the line label. So then the next piece that I want to show you, which um, is got a world's end label, uh, this is dated 1984, and what she loved about her research is she would tweak it a little bit. Like oftentimes she would replicate men's shirting that like had a 500-year-old pattern, but she'd make one sleeve longer than the other. So she had, um, not in this case, but she had a way of making it her own. So the next piece I want to show you is part of her Harris Tweed collection. Uh, I really like this one because it has um, details that are, you know, traditional tailoring, but it's cropped. Uh, it's like a writing jacket. And uh, interestingly enough, this bustier, which can be quite revealing, is from the same collection, I believe, 1987, 1987, yeah. So, um, if you look at the construction of her, all of her bustiers going down the road, we've had many over the years, the boning that is placed is, it's not easy to make these things. And um, we mixed this uh, Harris Tweet collection with the mini crinny, but that's coming down the road. The closure on this has her logo uh, engraved on it which is the orb. And we have several examples of that logo uh, in the jewelry over here. And um, also on the purse, you'll see it in a lot of different places. Uh, another example of a bustier, this is the red label. This is from spring, summer 1990. Um, and what's really interesting about this piece is, yes, it has the intricate boning, but the choice of fabric, it's like a, a ribbon and a raffia alternating. And I'm actually quite amazed that this thing has survived because raffia is not the sturdiest of fibers to use. The collection has a lot of 18th century inspired designs. She collaborated with an artist named Gary Bale. And uh, we have that example. We have this beautiful bustier or blouse with um, a front piece. And it's kind of a velvet fabric, but the metallic silk screening on this is really in fantastic condition. And then we have another variation, uh, which is a year later, called Dressing Up. Um, but you can see where the inspiration of um, 18th century painting comes in, in the dress and also in this purse. 
So it's possible that this is also from the Dressing Up collection. I love the Cafe Society collection because it has um, a punk feel. It has um, a 60s playful, sexy feel. This one is from spring summer 1994, but we're not 100% sure of the date. We still need to do a little research on dating this one. Now, if you want to see technical, we'll put this on a dress form later. This amazing cut piece is from Viva la Coquette, The Flirt, 1995. And it's a cropped jacket with uh, puff sleeves, but the skirt is short in the front and long in the back, and it's just beautiful. You want to make a statement walking into a room, this is the way to do it. And of course, you see photographs of Vivian wearing this fantastic <laughs> fake fur. It's from Anglomania, 1995, and it's red label, so it's not her top of the line, but it's really wonderful. And if you look at the inside, there's a, like a lucite button with the orb, uh, metal orb on it. So her identity is everywhere. Um, we don't have these dated, but this one is, uh, uh, the construction is breathtaking. It has a bustier on the inside, and it's draped with all this kind of, tool explosion. It's definitely 90s, but what year, we're not sure. And then, in the manner of Galenga, Fortuny, and Babani, we have the stenciled stretch velvet dress, which the stenciling is all in really good condition. And you wonder if this technique um, she was inspired by Fortuny. I wouldn't be surprised. And then last but not least, this is reminiscent of the velvet piece I pulled out just a moment ago. The cut on this is beyond. The craftsmanship in tailoring is incredible. It's a super short skirt in the front with this pinstripe, kind of man-tailored jacket. But we would be remiss if we didn't mention how, um, you know, people, when people think of Naomi Campbell, they think of her falling on the catwalk because the height of the shoes that she was wearing, uh, they were incredibly high. These shoes are um, elevated, she calls them elevated court shoes. They're from the 1990s portrait collection as well. And you can see that the platform is just an extension of the actual shoe itself. Um, her shoes, her accessories are really uh, big sellers, I think. Over the course of her really long career, various designs have gone through many different incarnations. The orb uh, originated during her Harris Tweed period, and it was a way for her to acknowledge her, um, her British background, but also she wanted to make it um, more modern. And so uh, the planet, the, uh, is it, I think it's Saturn, um, kind of brought it into more of a futuristic place. Uh, this particular necklace is one of my all-time favorites. It's, uh, it's a strong statement piece. Um, I need to also mention that it's difficult because she's, she's had so many important collections over the years that if you're interested in finding out more about her, we will list the dates and the name of the collections at the very end. But um, one of the important ones, because she went through a period of really addressing femininity, uh, the mini crinny, which uh, this is from 1985, is one that uh, is very popular amongst collectors. I can't believe that this one came to me with the original Charivari price tag. 
it's uh, hard to believe someone would buy this and not wear it. It's pretty awesome. And then uh, two other pieces that we have that are super special. This champagne satin um, bustier jacket and really kind of draped and scrunched skirt. Uh, this particular one, it's in pristine condition. It is obviously gold label because of the draping and the intricacy. And this is from spring 2000. So I think someone getting married should buy this and wear it as their wedding dress. It's pretty special. And then this amazing um, gown is from 1998, autumn winter, her dressed to scale collection. It's really difficult. This would need to be on a mannequin for you to see how beautiful um, the draping and the cut is on this particular dress. And the large buttons have the orb engraved on it. So that's the collection. I will say that all of these pieces are available to purchase if anyone is motivated. So please email us uh, if you're interested in getting prices. And uh, other than that, I need to get ready for show off. This week's show off is a perfect segue from the Westwood because it is the more than iconic Azadine Alaya 1986 leather zip dress. If you think of this dress, you think of Alaya standing next to um, an Amazon model holding a dog, or he's holding a dog. And I honestly never thought I'd ever have this piece because it's made of lambskin and uh, that gets surface damage really easily. This piece is in incredible condition. And it is very much a tribute to S&M and um, zippers are everywhere, uh, including the back. Uh, this is clearly for someone a little bit more long-waisted. But what I love about this is going back to Westwood and the trailblazer that she is and was, uh, in 1974, she and Malcolm McLaren opened up, uh, changed the name of their shop to Sex. And there they sold t-shirts with a lot of very blatant sexual uh, graphics and images. But in 75, McLaren started the Sex Pistols, and a lot of their clothing was really pushing the envelope um, to the point of where they actually got uh, they had to go to court for obscenity charges. So uh, fortunately, we're past that stage. And um, with pieces like this, you can use your imagination. We will have a, a lot of information for you to follow up on if you want. So thank you so much for watching. Please tell your friends. Please subscribe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. That's it for now. Bye.